I reflected in the first video on Elizabeth I's death on how there are parallels between the life and times of the first Elizabeth and that of Elizabeth II. And in death there are parallels too. Both queens died in the intimacy of places they loved away from public glare. Elizabeth I at Richmond and Elizabeth II at Balmoral. Both queens had very public funerals, with funeral processions that made their way along some of the same streets in London, and had funeral services held in the same location, Westminster Abbey. Many of the same trappings of state were on view around and on top of their coffins. We have extraordinary continuity in the United Kingdom through these things, and royal funerals are events that link the now distant past and the present rather tangibly. Although Elizabeth I died in Richmond Palace to the west of London, her funeral took place in the capital, and it was the most splendid public affair. She chose to be buried not in Windsor, like her father Henry VIII, but in the great mausoleum of the Tudor dynasty, the chapel her grandfather Henry VII had constructed as the Lady Chapel for Westminster Abbey, and where he and his Queen Elizabeth of York were buried. It was also, of course, the place where Elizabeth I's sister, Mary I, and her brother, King Edward VI, were also interred. There was the customary lying in state before the funeral itself. In the late Middle Ages, the lying in state of English sovereigns took place in Old St Paul's Cathedral, in the heart of the old city of London. Henry VII was the last English king, his body lay in state there. Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, had died at Whitehall Palace, which he had acquired from Cardinal Wolsey in 1529, and his lying in state before his funeral procession to Windsor was in the more intimate setting of the presence chamber in his apartments, and then in the chapel royal in the palace. Elizabeth's brother, Edward VI, had died at Greenwich, and his body was brought to Whitehall Palace too, but only the day before his burial. Elizabeth's sister, Mary Tudor, lay in state in St James's Palace for three weeks, where she had died. For Elizabeth, it was decided that she would lie like her father in Whitehall, the centre of Tudor court life. Immediately after her death, her coffin rested for some days in her apartments at Richmond, before being taken up the Thames by barge to Whitehall. There appears to have been near universal grief and shock among her subjects at her death. According to John Stripe, the chronicler, the following lines were written and circulated when her body was moved from Richmond to Whitehall, and they reflect the prevailing sentiment. The Queen was brought by water to Whitehall. At every stroke the oars did tears let fall. More clung about the barge. Fish under water wept out their eyes of pearl. Elizabeth had made clear instructions that she should not be embalmed by evisceration, as was common practice in this period for the social elite, but her instruction appears to have been ignored. Robert Cecil ordered her to be bowled, and for the Queen's body to then be wrapped in sear cloth, waxed cloth, and then clapped, i.e. wrapped and soldered up in a lead shell, as was customary. Elizabeth Southwell records that the lead coffin was then placed within a wooden case covered in very fine velvet. She also records that while she was watching the Queen's coffin at Whitehall for a guard of honour of six ladies was always in attendance during the lying in state, the coffin, lead and searcloth split open with a loud crack and had to be new trimmed up. This seems to replicate the old story circulating about Henry VIII's coffin bursting open at Zion, which I address in my video on Henry's funeral. Elizabeth then lay in state in the Palace of Whitehall for nearly four weeks before her funeral on the 28th of April 1603. I have heard it said that this long lying in state was to give James VI of Scotland, now James I of England, time to get to London. That may well be the case, for her lying in state was of unusually long duration, but it may have been simply to ensure all was properly prepared for the funeral. In any case, James would not have attended the funeral, as it was not considered seemly 
for the sovereign to attend the funeral of his predecessor. The lying in state was not a public affair in the same way that Queen Elizabeth II's was. It wasn't open to all, but within the intimate confines of the palace, it was primarily for the court and for the royal household, and those who could afford the customary mourning attire. If you're interested in learning more about the Palace of Whitehall, the centre of English court life and the reign of Elizabeth I, why not get hold of this month's issue of the Antiquary magazine? Using contemporary visual evidence, I piece together some of the history of this extraordinary lost royal palace in the heart of London. This month has a real Tudor theme to it, as I also look at Stained Glass by Henry VIII's Court Glazier and the significance of the heraldic displays seen at royal and noble funerals. In an elaborate funeral procession, Queen Elizabeth I's coffin was taken from Whitehall for burial in Westminster Abbey. We are very fortunate that a couple of sets of contemporary drawings in the British Library provide visual evidence of the Queen's funeral procession. The drawings are without question the work of a herald or herald painter involved in organising the funeral. The heralds of the College of Arms were members of the royal household and their job in the late medieval and early modern period was primarily um, with the control and display of heraldry of coats of arms. As royal and noble funerals were events where great displays of heraldry were used to express the status of the deceased, the heralds became in effect the royal undertakers and it was their job to organise the funerals of both royalty and the nobility. One set of drawings was originally part of a parchment roll and has been cut up and illustrates the funeral not only of the Queen, but of other prominent people. And it was probably created not simply to record the events, but as evidence for the heralds of precedent. And this collection is rather attractive, as the images have all been coloured in. The second set of drawings is still on a parchment roll, and is said to be the work of William Camden, the chronicler, who was one of the most prominent heralds at the time, He was, in 1603, Clarencio, King of Arms, one of the senior heralds. These uncoloured drawings were later engraved and published by Nichols in 1788. Now, I can't show all the images in this video, but I will publish Nichols' version of them on my blog with a description of what is going on in each scene. The Queen was accompanied to her grave by a procession that must have been longer than the distance between Whitehall and and the Abbey. It was not a military affair, as modern state funerals are. Only the Queen's household guards were involved, heading up the procession and guarding her coffin along the route. She was accompanied to her grave by her entire household and the whole nobility of England. Everyone who served her in any formal capacity, from the great lords of the Privy Council, to the clergy and singers of her chapel, right down to the lowest groom of the scullery. Members of the Corporation of London were also included, the mayor and the aldermen. The procession was headed up by a group of poor people, who on the day were provided with both clothing and food. Fifteen poor men of Westminster and 266 poor women. The state trumpeters provided musical accompaniment and were spread out through the procession, and groups of mourners were led by sergeants of arms carrying their ceremonial maces. Directly before the Queen's coffin were borne by the heralds in their colourful surcoats, which were over black gowns with hoods, the traditional heraldic and chivalric achievements of arms that express the sovereign's military leadership and nobility. The helm or helmet, the surcoat or coat armour, the sword and the shield, which was known as the target. William Camden, as Clarencio King of Arms, is shown carrying the surcoat. And the whole procession along its length was interspersed with other heralds bearing banners of various parts of Elizabeth's kingdom, the arms of her Earldom of Chester, of the Crown Duchy of Cornwall, of Wales and of Ireland, and the great embroidered banner of England. There was also the banner of the Greyhound, the personal banner of Henry the Seventh, and her own personal banners, the banner of the Dragon of Wales and the Lion of England.
Four plumed horses in full morning livery of black velvet pulled the coffin on a chariot, and over the chariot six knights bore a canopy, and around it mourners were carrying twelve flags called banneroles, emblazoned with the Queen's many heraldic achievements. The coffin was protected by the gentlemen pensioners, armed with poleaxes reversed. These men are now known as the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms, and they fulfilled the exact same purpose at the funeral of Elizabeth II. The coffin of the Queen was covered in a purple pall of velvet, and on this was what the documents refer to as the representation, and elsewhere as a lively picture of Her Majesty's whole body. This was a lifelike funeral effigy of the Queen, with her eyes open, made of painted wood by John Colt, and it was dressed in her state robes and had the auburn sceptre in its hands and a crown of state upon its head. The regalia used were not props or stand-ins. The effigy was wearing the real state crown and in its hands were the real sceptre and orb that the Queen used in life. This sort of effigy was a common feature of royal funerals until the English Civil War. The last head of state to have one was Oliver Cromwell. The effigy of Elizabeth remains in part in the collection of Westminster Abbey, though it was mostly remade in wax in 1760. But the body of the figure, made of wood and plaster by Colt, is dressed in a pair of stays, undergarments that may have been Elizabeth's own. Behind the Queen's coffin was her horse, the palfrey of estate, again bedecked in mourning livery and led by the master of the horse, Edward Somerset, the Earl of Worcester. And behind the horse walked the principal mourner, the Marchioness of Northampton, who was accompanied by the Lord Treasurer of the Household, Sir William Knollys, who is another cousin of the Queen and a grandson of Mary Boleyn, and the Lord High Admiral, the Earl of Nottingham. Behind the Marchioness, two countesses carried her train, and then behind them walked the ladies of the Queen's household and other noble women. Elizabeth Southwell was probably among them. All the nobles were wearing mourning apparel. Ellen Snackenborg, Marchioness of Northampton, the principal mourner, was a Swedish-born noblewoman. She was the widow of William Parr, Marquess of Northampton, the brother of Henry VIII's last queen, Catherine Parr. And Queen Elizabeth I considered William to be her uncle, and Ellen, or Helena, as she was known in England, her close kinswoman. She was also the senior peeress at the time of the Queen's death, and it is by that status that she acted as chief mourner. And it seems that the whole of London came out to see this extraordinary sight of the court accompanying Gloriana the short distance to her grave. The London chronicler John Stowe wrote of it, Westminster was surcharged with multitudes of all sorts of people in their streets, he says. Houses, windows, leads and gutters that came out to see the obsequy. And when they beheld her statue lying upon the coffin, there was such a general sighing, groaning and weeping as the like hath not been seen or known in the memory of man. On arrival at the Abbey, the Queen's coffin, with its funeral effigy upon it, was then placed, as per tradition, in an elaborate structure called a hearse. It's only in modern times that funeral cars have come to be known as hearses. In the Middle Ages, these hearses, these structures, were covered in candles, but after the Reformation, the candles appear to have been mostly omitted. There is a coloured image of the hearse in the first of the British Library rolls. It is difficult to work out where the hearse was placed on the picture, but I suspect what the architectural background is uh, representing is the theatre, the coronation theatre of the Abbey, in which case, at her funeral, Elizabeth I's coffin rested in the exact position that Elizabeth II's coffin rested at hers. What the illustration does show clearly is the form of the hearse. It's an enclosure that could accommodate both the coffin and seating for the principal mourners, and over the top of it is a great towering canopy uh, covered in black cloth. 
there seems to be a rectangular strip of black fabric behind the canopy and I think this represents hangings hung up on the walls of the choir of the abbey. The hearse canopy is decorated with banners and pennons with heraldry expressing Elizabeth's status as Queen of England and of Ireland and of course her pretense to be the Queen of France. And it's also decorated with her motto, Semper Idem, always one in the same, it means, which had previously been used by her mother, Anne Boleyn. Their canopy is also decorated with devices that refer to the Tudor dynasty and to her Yorkist and Lancastrian forebears. The double Tudor rose amalgamating the red rose of Lancaster and the white rose of York. The Beaufort portcullis of her great-grandmother, Margaret Beaufort, the falcon and fetterlock of her great-grandfather Edward IV, and rather surprisingly, perhaps, the crowned white falcon badge of her mother, Anne Boleyn. Now, we saw at the funeral of Elizabeth II last year how, before her coffin was lowered into the royal vault at Windsor, the imperial state crown, the sovereign scepter and the orb were removed from on top of it. At Elizabeth I's funeral, the state crown and other items of regalia were also removed from her coffin before it was taken to the grave to be reused by her successor, and the funeral effigy was removed too before she was lowered into the burial vault. Although in English law, as soon as a sovereign dies, their successor immediately succeeds, there was also a sense that until the funeral rites were over, and these symbols of majesty were removed and the styles and titles of the late sovereign read out, something of their reigning power remained. Following the funeral service, Elizabeth's coffin was initially buried in the central and primary burial vault of Henry VII's chapel, occupied by her grandparents, King Henry VII and Queen Elizabeth of York, the founders of the Tudor dynasty. That was almost certainly at her request. However... In 1606, James I had her body moved. We don't quite know why, but it seems that James I thought of himself as Henry VII's true successor, and that his role as the unifier of the two ancient kingdoms of England and Scotland gave him precedence somehow over his childless predecessor Elizabeth. He probably thought he deserved that central spot next to Henry VII, and he was, in time, duly buried in it. James had Elizabeth's coffin moved from centre stage to a small burial vault that contained the remains of her sister, Mary Tudor. Mary didn't have a monument, she made no provision for one in her will, and Elizabeth didn't commission one for her in her lifetime. By tradition, after Elizabeth's accession, Mary's burial place was not treated with dignity, but was piled high with the discarded altar stones from the various chapels where the Catholic Mass had been celebrated in the Abbey. After her reburial, King James commissioned a monument to Elizabeth that stood over this joint grave, with an effigy of Elizabeth dressed in her state robes, just as she appeared on the day of her funeral. In fact, Colt's wooden effigy may well have been used as the source for the sculptor's work. The effigy lies under a canopy, at once again displaying all Elizabeth's heraldry and proclaiming her lineage, and the monument has a long Latin inscription referring to her forebears. It reads, To the eternal memory of Elizabeth, Queen of England, France and Ireland, daughter of King Henry VIII, granddaughter of King Henry VII, great-granddaughter of King Edward IV, mother of her country, a nursing mother to religion and all liberal sciences, skilled in many languages, adorned with excellent endowments both of body and mind, and excellent for princely virtues beyond her sex. James, King of Great Britain, France and Ireland, hath devoutly and justly erected this monument to her whose virtues and kingdoms he inherits." The monument does not commemorate Mary Tudor, except by a single inscription, again in Latin, on the base. Partners both in throne and grave, rest we two sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, in the hope of one resurrection. The sculptor James I commissioned to make the monument was a Fleming called Maximilian Colt, who also made the monument of Robert Cecil, Elizabeth's little pygmy, at Hatfield in 
James didn't expend much money on the monument, relatively speaking, less than £1,000, of which Colt was paid 720 The total cost of the work is unclear. However, what is clear is that the tomb of James I's mother, Mary Queen of Scots, executed by Elizabeth I, was much grander and more expensive. Mary was exhumed from her original grave in Peterborough Cathedral in 1616 and rather pointedly reburied in the south choir aisle of Henry VII's chapel in a position that more or less mirrors that of Elizabeth. Her tomb by Cornelius and William Cure cost at least twice as much as Elizabeth I's. In the 19th century, the then Dean of Westminster, Arthur Stanley, who was looking for the lost coffin of James I, had some workmen excavate the space, the empty space, between the tomb of Elizabeth and those of James I's two infant daughters to see if James was buried there. He wasn't, but during the excavation, a, a small aperture was made into the vault under Elizabeth's monument to see what was within. The vault was found to be low and narrow, and it was distinctly seen that there were only two coffins within it, one resting directly upon the other. The lower coffin was that of Mary, and the upper, which was larger, was that of Elizabeth. Elizabeth's lead coffin was seen to be anthropoidal. The lead had been shaped around her sear cloth covered corpse, but it was seen to be set within the remains of a wooden case, the sides of which had mostly rotted away. Part of the stout lid remained, and it was found to be decorated with a carved Tudor rose, flanked by the Queen's cipher ER, and the date 1603. The bottom of the coffin was shown to be elm, and the lid oak. And reflecting Elizabeth Southwell's account, it was still covered in scraps of the rich red silk velvet. The grave has not been opened since, and the two sisters, both queens, still lie there together. Thanks very much for watching. Mm-hmm.